we um, started uh, tomorrow. But um, there are two other topics that, uh, that I've been asked about, and it may be a good idea to expand on them. They are related to the, to the things we talked about yesterday. And then just for fun, I thought that it would be nice to show you another thing. Um, and to show you how dynamic the whole field is, um, there was a paper that with an interesting result yesterday, and it links to something that we've been discussing. And it's very interesting to see that you work in a very dynamic uh, field, um, unlike uh, nuclear physics, which is more like the ancient Greek language. No one cares about it. It's a bad thing, OK? Um, we really worked in something that's, well, I have to apologize to some of my friends. <laughs> uh, but I think we really uh, uh, work in something that develops uh, on a daily basis and you can see some very fundamental results coming out uh, uh, frequently. This one has to do with, um, we discussed um, bound entanglement at some, so I'm going to make a small digression just to tell you about it. It's very interesting. It's a very short paper and it's very simple to understand. I think I made some notes and you can see the, uh, the logic of the proof. So basically, at some stage we talked about partial transposition as um, uh, as a witness of entanglement in general. And we said that if your state has a positive partial transposition, uh, positive partial transposition, that means uh, that um, it could be separable or it could be entangled. Because in general, this is not, um, this is not a necessary and sufficient condition. Okay? Uh, now, if it's entangled, we made a conclusion that it cannot be uh, distillable. So if, uh, so let's say rho is PPT, if rho is inseparable, uh, then, um, then basically rho cannot be distilled. <coughs> and my logic was that um, the final state is a maximally entangled state, has a negative partial transposition. And if you look at the local operations, they have to preserve the sign of the partial transposition. So I cannot start with a positive partial transposition, act on it locally, and end up with a negative partial transposition. That's where the contradiction is. And I think as soon as this was realized in 1997 um, um, or 8, uh, there was immediately a question of what about MPT? What about negative partial transposition? So this, this means, in other words, rho, rho is bound uh, and bound. <coughs> and then the big question, which attracted quite a lot of people to think about it for some time, so for the last 10 years, um, was, was, and you have papers with some numerical evidence, which is quite interesting, actually. Uh, the question was, are there, um, um, are there MPT? So negative partial transposition, but still bound, entangled states. Okay, it was a big question. I think you may even find it on Werner's website where he lists, I don't know how many open problems in the field that he considers uh, interesting. I think you can yourself log into there and put a problem out there if you think it's interesting. Um, and I think this one was there for a long time. Now, what the paper yesterday claims, so I was presenting the argument, uh, there may be some uh, small things that are wrong. I didn't really look at every, every line of derivation, but somehow the whole thing makes sense to me. It's a very simple, it's a very simple proof. Uh, it's, it's basically half a page proof, so I think you can have a look at it. After. So the interesting answer is that, is that it's, it's, there, is, there is no such a state. Uh, that's negative, uh, so the answer is no, no. Um, providing that this paper is correct, of course, but, but it's a very simple logic. So what the paper does is the following. The paper says, let me tr start with a state which has a negative partial transposition. In the same way, in the same way that here we, it's very similar logic. Here we started with PPT, and then local operations ended up with the PPT. Therefore, I cannot have a singlet as a final state because that's a negative partial transposition state. Here, the logic is going to be, let's start with a negative partial transposition. Let's do some projections. And let's show that I cannot uh, end up, th that I have to end up with something that's also negative partial transposition in the two qubit sector, two two qubit sector, which means that it's distillable. And, and how do they do it? So if you re recall, 
negative partial transposition simply means that, uh, uh, that there is a state psi uh, and rho transpose, so rho has two subsystems, one and two. Psi is also one and two. A negative partial transposition simply means this. So I'm assuming that the state is a negative partial transposition state. And now the question is, uh, the question is, well, you can rewrite this in terms of a witness, and we also played the game with that. We said, um, I can write this as a trace of the state rho itself and the witness w, but the witness is, is basically just psi. This was this Yavorkovsky isomorphism, if you like. It's just the state psi partially transposed itself. So if I take the trace, then I can basically switch this transpose to here, and then I've got the psi psi, I invert them by definition of trace, and you can see that these two guys are exactly the same quantity. Okay? So this guy is the witness of entanglement. It's just a one-to-one -one correspondence. So if I have a negative partial transposition, then I can rewrite it like that. And now what you do is you just write down by brute force your state, all the elements of the state, and your uh, and so state rho and state psi. It's, it's it's really very simple. So rho, I think, would be something like um, sum over i j k l. It's a bipartite system. Okay. So I need four indices because I'm going to be doing the cat and the bra. The cat needs two indices for Alice and Bob, and the bra needs two indices for Alice and Bob. So if this is something like rho i j k l, these are the density matrix elements. And then you've got something like i j k l. Okay? It's the most general state of, of two subsystems. Very interesting. I mean it's just there's nothing nothing unusual there. Psi you can write also as an entangled state. So you choose some basis and you say, I'm gonna imagine that psi is something like sum over k. Lambda k, lambda k are just the Schmidt coefficients of this guy. Uh, e k and f k. Okay, so this is this is like an orthogonal basis for Alice, e k. Another orthogonal basis for Bob, f k. And any state we know can be written like that. In fact, you don't lose any generality. I think to make the whole thing a little bit simpler, you can assume in addition that lambdas are always positive numbers. Okay. In fact, okay, some of them could be zero, so it could be. So if you have a negative sign in these lambdas, you can always absorb that into the definition of the basis. Okay? So instead of using zero as your basis element, you, you use minus zero. So you can always get away with positive numbers here. Now you shove this guy into here, and you shove this sign into there, and hopefully after a few lines of this is the one that I trust they can do themselves. So I didn't really check this one. It would be interesting if they couldn't and we found a mistake. <coughs> it's too simple to find a mistake there. So basically this is sum over k, lambda k squared, rho k, the diagonal elements of rho, plus two times the off-diagonals. And the off-diagonals are written in this way. You will see the logic immediately. So this ckl is just the lambda k, lambda l, the real part of rho l k k l. So basically, after taking the, after putting this guy here, making the partial transposition of this guy, multiplying it by rho, and summing up the diagonal elements, which is the trace, you will get an expression like this. So you know, this real part is nothing but the sum of the the the, the rho plus the complex conjugate divided by two. So k l l k plus the other way around l k k l divided by 2. Okay? So this is believable, I guess. That's your witness. And I'm requesting it to be negative because rho is MPT. Okay? Rho is just MPT by, by, by assumption. And now what I do is I say, well, let me project this onto Alice's side. So I have some kind of projection which projects onto a two-dimensional subspace on Alice's side and a two-dimensional subspace on Bob's side. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the state after that. So call this state rho KL. And I'm, I'm basically projecting, we, we're all used to this kind of thing from before, I'm making a projection of the original state. I'll, I'll show you what this P is. The P is just the sum 
of the KNL vector. So basically, PKL is a product vector. It's uh, EK, uh, EK uh, plus EL, EL, and plus, I mean, t tensor product F, the same for F. So this is how Al Alice projects onto the subspace with K and L being your vectors. Bob does the same, FK, FK plus FL. FL. And now they look at the state that they get. And now I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume that that I can have a bound in time. I'm going to assume to the contrary of this. I'm going to assume that you can have a state that cannot be distilled. What does that mean? That means all of these guys have to be PPT. Because if I find one with a negative partial transposition, it's a two two qubit systems. I can distill it because for two two qubit systems, this is a necessary and sufficient condition. All of it is distillable. There are no bound states there. So now I require uh, assume that all rho KLs are basically PPT, and I'm going to show you that this cannot be the case. Okay. So. What does it mean it's all PPT? It means that all the eigenvalues of this guy are all, all eigenvalues of rho KL are positive or non-negative, if you like. Okay? Let me give you one of these eigenvalues. One is enough to shoot. You don't need to compute all, all. well, one is always positive. Partial transport, you're, you're right. Thank you. Uh, all eigenvalues of this guy partially transposed. Absolutely right. Um, and one of them, so one of them is always, always positive because it's the same as the original density matrix. And now you can look at the next, the next three. Um, and the next sub subdeterminant looks like this: rho k k. I'm going to get tired with this k's now. I'm going to just put four k at some stage. L, K, K, L, uh, rho star, that's the complex conjugate. It's, it really looks like, like the density matrix. And this is rho L, 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 L. This guy has to be non-negative. Okay? This translates into, into one of these eigenvalues being positive. All of them have to be positive. But it's enough to, get, look, to look at this one and to kill the whole argument. That's, that's why this is really super simple. Uh, it's really amazing that, uh, that not many people have, uh, have done that. So now, what does this mean? This means that the product of these guys is greater than the product of these guys, the off diagonal elements, okay? But, so let me write the first line and you will see immediately what I mean. This means that rho 4k's, okay? K, 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 I'm too lazy, sorry. Uh, times rho 4l's uh, is just greater than or equal to the mod squared of this. So this is K, L or L in this notation doesn't make any difference. L K K L squared. But this is now the guy which is the real part. So now I'm linking it to the to the real part, this guy here. That's the guy I want. Because it enters this uh, witness of, of entanglement. So this is real of L K K L squared. I've got that inequality. And now the interesting thing is that if you follow a set of two inequalities, if I multiply both sides by lambda k, lambda l, so I'm now trying to make this guy look like the coefficient c. What I need to do is I need to take a square root, okay, here, here, and here. And then I need to multiply, you see this is going to be one of those derivations where you cannot possibly take notes from me, but okay, I'm just giving you the, the logic. I multiply by lambda k lambda l here, lambda k lambda l, and now I'm going to sum up over all the k's and l's. And the interesting thing is that this guy is simply your ckl, the mod ckl, sum over k and l. You can put it k greater than l and a factor of 2 to look exactly like that. And the left hand side of this inequality is simply always less than or equal sum over lambda k squared. This is the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, 4k. Okay? So here is the other important result. This one says this is the MPT state by assumption. This one says this is what I need 
if the result is always going to be a PPP state, which means I cannot distill it. Now, this is a positive number. For this quantity to be negative, this guy needs to be negative, but in magnitude more negative than the positivity of this guy. But it's the exact opposite that I just showed you now. Can't be the case. This guy is in direct contradiction with that guy. They point in exactly the opposite directions. Okay? Very simple. So the proof says, if I project into all qubit states, I look at one of the eigenvalues for each, and I request that they are positive, then I'm going to arrive in, the, uh, in, in exact contradiction to my, to my assumption that this was a negative partial transposition state. Therefore, I cannot have a negative partial transposition bound state. Okay? This is a two, two pages long paper. The first, pa the first page is just describing our lecture on on, on entanglement and so on, and the next half a page is the proof here. That's it. Okay, it took 10 years for this. Interesting. But it's a big one. Okay, if it's correct, it's a big one. Um, Raphael actually alerted me to this one, so I'm, I'm just telling you how the proof goes because I was curious to see um, whether it's really that simple. Anyway, you can now erase this from your memory. Um, and we continue with what we did yesterday. So, phase. Uh, so, what I want to do is, is just repeat what I said about Shore, and then I want to discuss the two topics I think that, that were, the proof makes sense. I don't know, if you checked it, double checked it, but it makes sense. Uh, that, so basically what I want to do is I want to um, summarize Shore, and then I want to discuss the two topics that, uh, that I think may be interesting. One is, uh, one is this phase. I was, there was a question yesterday about the phase, the, the relative phase and the overall phase, and what's the what's the status of these things. And the other one was about, um, about actually, uh, I think Marcella was saying that he couldn't believe that I told you about the power of one qubit algorithm and I didn't mention Discord. So I mentioned a little bit Discord there because I said entanglement doesn't exist if you make this guy, if you make this guy very mixed. And then there was a question of, so what is the resource for quantum computing? And somehow this guy called Discord seems to be non-zero there and scale in a similar way, okay? So let me let me say a little bit about these phases because I'll I'll, I'll, I'll just summarize short first uh, and and then talk about phases. Um, what we said is that uh, is that Shor's algorithm really is a phase estimation, um, and what you're trying to estimate is you're trying to estimate periodicity of a certain function, which is in Shor's case um, written in term in, inside the phase of of different orthogonal states. So we said something like, I start with a register with all x's. Um, doesn't matter, from 0 to n. Um, so you need to superpose enough x's. And, and you can think of roughly as the size of the, of the number you're trying to, to factorize. Because the things will start to repeat faster than that usually. So you don't need to sum up really up to a, a very high number. You only need to get something that that, that's one period worth of, of uh, summation. And then you have some number A, which, which was um, construct or randomly chosen so that hopefully with high probability that there are no common divisors between A and N. And then I said the main thing you have to really uh, be able to do is you have to be able to, um, to, compute, to compute this function. So you know, normally you would start from X and zero X you would create by just applying Hadamard gate to each qubit. If you start with states zero everywhere, apply Hadamard, you will get a superposition of all elements. Now you've got this function here, which computes this A of X, if you like, unitarily, which means for every X I compute that. And now I'm going to try to estimate the period of this. I'm going to give you this as an example with with just two numbers, with, with just uh, 2 and, and 15, so that you can keep in your mind track of what's going on. Um, OK, so, um, so, so let, let's really choose a equals, uh, a equals 2 and n equals 15. Uh, then I said that you basically have to compute a to 0 mod 15 and a to 1, 1, 15, and so on. So the state looks, looks like this. For x equals 0, all I'm doing is 2 to 0 mod 15. It's a highly entangled state. For 
um, a equal, for x equals 1, I'm doing 2 to 1 mod 15, and so on, right? Um, so basically, basically what I'll have when I, when I expand this um, is, and, and you know that this will repeat because a to the power of 4 mod 15 is 16 mod 15, and this is equal to 1. So I start with 1, 2, 4, 8, 1 and so on. I keep repeating this. So the first register always grows. So it, it looks like that. 0, 1, 1, 2, then 2, 4, then 3, 8, and then bang, 4 already gives me 1 again. Okay? 5 gives me 2 again, and so on. Yeah? So the second register just runs periodically um, in units of 4. And typically, this would be the state of my computer. It's highly entangled. You see, that's why it's very difficult to see how to get rid of this entanglement. And it's a big question whether you can really make the state very mixed and still, like what we did in the power of one, com uh, one qubit, and still get some kind of exponential speed up. Because it, it, this really relies on a very high degree of entanglement between the two registers. Um, so what, what, you, what can you do now? Well, you can do many things. Um, but probably the, uh, the easiest thing is, is simply to, to factor out one of these guys and then look at the, look at the periodicity that you have to, uh, that you have to estimate. Uh, and it really, doesn't, you know, it really doesn't matter what, uh, what number you, uh, you factor out. So for example, if you look at number one in the second register, it occurs here again. Okay, and then it occurs when we hit 8 here and so on. Okay, so basically if you factor out 1 from the second, from the second register, uh, then the first register looks like 0, plus 4, plus 8, plus 12, and so on, depending on how high n is that you chose. And it's only 15 in this case, so it's a very small, it's a very small entangled state. Now, uh, the next one, you can factor out 2. But actually, what you notice, and that's the, the, the key thing, is you get, you get the same periodicity in the superposition, but just shifted by one, by one unit. So I've got 1 plus 5, 1 plus 5, uh, plus uh, 9, and so on. Okay. And now you can factor all of them because the next number will be 4 and the last number will be 8. There are no more numbers here because, uh, because that's the periodicity of the function. It's just 4. So I can't have more than 4 states in this time. And, and now, and now I, I have to look at the first register and I have to say, can I estimate this period in any way? Um, so this is like 2 plus 6 and so on. This is 3 plus 7, and so on, OK? Uh, initially, the way that Shore phrased this was to say, I now measure the second register. It's an easy way of seeing things if you measure it. With equal probability, in this case, of uh, one quarter, you would get one of these four states. But again, it doesn't matter which of the four states you get, because they all have exactly the same periodicity of four. Um, in fact, you, you don't need to measure. So what 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 Shaw would say measure measure two, and then uh, and then Fourier transform the first register to get from this superposition of number states into the superposition of phase states, and these phase states are the guy that are going to contain to contain your periodicity r. So basically, um, you know, let's say you get uh, number one out then your superposition is something like 0 plus 4 plus 8 and so on. And now you perform uh, what's known as a discrete Fourier transform. Uh, which in our language, what we discussed yesterday just means let's go into the phase, into the phase um, operator eigenstates. These are like complementary bases to, to the number bases. And then in this basis, the phase now will be encoded not so here the phase is really encoded in the numbers. They differ by uh, by four, 
And if I really measured it here, I would never be able to estimate the phase. It would be crazy to measure now, because I would get one of these guys. And if I get number 8, what do I know what the period is? It could be anything. I don't know any other number. Okay? So in a way, it's not really, it's not really good to do this kind of stuff. But if you, if you rotated this first, and that's the key thing, you can't do this classically. So really the key thing here is not whether you can exponentiate, because exponentiating is an easy operation classically as well. Like I said, you need something like m cubed operations to do this. Okay? That's an easy one. The difficult one for a classical computer is to do a discrete Fourier transform. The guy just has to transform each of them independently, and there are too many of them of these numbers, so it really becomes very inefficient. But quantum, you can do it in, in one go, and basically what you get is, is, is the picture that I presented yesterday. If you think of the number state basis, this is your zero, this, so this, this direction here is the amplitude. Just like a diffraction grating. I've got an amplitude unit transmission at zero, I've got a unit transmission at slate four, I've got a unit transmission at slate 8, and so on. It's a periodic function. What happens when I do a Fourier transform of that? Well, what happens when I do a Fourier transform of that is that I go into, into, into another periodic structure, of course. Uh, periodicity is preserved. It's just that the periodicity here, so if you think of this period as what we call it R, the periodicity in the Fourier transform, it will be 1 over R. Okay. And, and what you can show is that, is that uh, is the following. So now you have to be able to measure this 1 over r. And what you can show is that it's enough to make two independent measurements. And you can already, with high probability, get the value of r. So I make one measurement, and I get something like value m over r. It's one of these peaks, m over r. Then I do again, so twice. But factor of 2 doesn't mean anything to a computer scientist, if you like. I get m prime over r. Okay. Now I've got two numbers, and I have to. They have the same denominator. They have different numerators, and now I have to guess what the denominator is from these structures. And you can do this with a very quick polynomial algorithm. The worst case scenario is if you make a mistake in your inference, you will go back, infer wrong factors of the number, and you will multiply them, and you won't get n. Start the process over again. But basically, given that this is very efficient to estimate R from here. You won't need to repeat this more than more than a, a, a polynomial number of times. Uh, so basically, your number your number superposition here goes into something like uh, uh, k e to the two pi i uh, k over R uh, phi k phi k is the Fourier transform of the number k. Okay? So Fourier transform of k. It's the phase basis. Okay? So instead of looking at the periodicity in numbers, I kicked it back into the phase. That's this picture here. It goes as 1 over r. And now all I need to do is measure these phases. Okay? It's really like an interferometer. And, and the, the idea is, 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 is here. Yes. So you can show formally with lots of mathematics, and there is something called Chinese remainder theorem or whatever else is there, stuff you don't want to know about as a physicist. But basically, you just have to believe that this can be done, uh, that this can be done very efficiently. Um, and, and this is nice because somehow you really are reducing. So we're seeing Deutsch's algorithm, Shor's algorithm, uh, Grover's algorithm as a phase kick. We're also seeing the power of one qubit as, a, as an interferometer where all I'm doing is estimating the phase arising from some kind of unitary transformation. So there's a certain unified view in which every quantum computation really looks like do a Fourier transform, kick in some phase, whatever the function is telling you, do a final Fourier transform, measuring the number of bases, and you will get the result. And, and I challenge you to find anything that doesn't look like this, and it's called quantum computation. It really is exactly this. Now I want to talk a little bit about this phase notion because I think it's something we didn't really we didn't really talk about um, much, um, and it's important, especially when you're doing experiments. And I, I said that it leads to some surprising surprising notions, uh, uh, as as you will see. 
and lots of debate uh, in the community about it. So there's, of course, something that's called an overall phase of your, of your state. So if you have a system in a superposition and you've got some state outside, then, then we know that this doesn't make any difference and you have an infinite freedom of choice in this phase phi. So if you look at the block sphere, phi doesn't even exist there. Block sphere already looks at only the state itself. And every point of the block sphere you can think of as infinite number of points in terms of infinitely many different phases. They will all bunch into the same point because physically they are all indistinguishable from one another. So that's the state. As far as we know, this is the case with quantum mechanics. Um, there's a whole interesting game of, in physics. Um, if you require equations to be invariant under this statement, this is not the same now. Um, so overall phase cannot be detected in this way, but if you say, I've got a Schrodinger equation, I'd like it to be invariant under this kind of stuff, then you go into something that's known as gauge theory, and you can derive all fundamental forces in this way by, by requiring different kind of phases to exist there. So normal phase, a number, will give you uh, will give you electromagnetic field uh, from, from the Schrodinger equation, if you like. If you require some kind of 2 by 2 matrix to be your phase, you will get something like weak forces, 3 by 3 strong forces, 4 by 4, or whatever is, a gra is gravity. So you can derive this is called gauge, uh, gauge theories. So now, um, what we are talking about is a phase of this type, which you can detect, and that's something we've been doing ourselves all the time, and that's the one that's, uh, that's meaningful. Um, so you see, phase doesn't feature, this phase is, is not important because all I'm going to be doing, ultimately, is I'm going to be multiplying, multiplying the state psi with another state phi, and I'll be taking the mod square of this guy. That's the only guy that has a meaning in quantum mechanics. So, um, so if I multiply this by phi psi, then any phase information cancels out. See, if I change psi into e to the i theta 1 psi, and I change phi into whatever angle, e to the i theta 2 phi, uh, the difference between these two will appear here, but the same difference with a minus sign will appear over here. So this will be something like theta 1 minus theta 2, and this guy will be the conjugate of that, theta 1 minus theta 2. So these guys will give you identity when you multiply. The mod square cannot detect the phase, that's what I'm saying, this is dominance. And because everything comes from the mod square, you cannot meaningfully talk about the overall phase of your state. Pancharatnam was the first person to see what to do, and I think you can almost probably see now what to do. Uh, you can say, what if I don't, what if I don't engage just two states, but what if I go into three states? And this was a beautiful idea from classical optics, how to measure an overall phase in some sense. I'm, I'm twisting the language a little bit. So basically what Pancharatnam said is, you are taking two states, and you are looking at the inner product between them. And that, that is not changed by you changing the phase local here and here. But what if I went via another state, <coughs> psi 3, What's going to happen now? So now you're doing something like that, in a way. And, and the, the quantity that you would be computing is something like psi, psi 1, psi 2, psi 2, psi 3. See how Arabic I'm getting now. Right to left, and psi 3, psi 1. Okay? Here's the Pancharatnam phase. This guy has a phase. So it's meaningful to talk about the relative phase of three states. Uh, even though with two you cannot do anything. In a way. That's the so-called geometric phase if you go into quantum mechanics. Um, so this guy really contains the phase, and you can check it that if you change uh, each of the, 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 the states locally, you're still not going to change the value of this. This is, a, this, is a, this is a phase that's defined in an absolute way, in the sense that it doesn't matter what phases you attribute to the local ones. So how do I know that? Because psi1 comes as a cat, and it also comes up as a bra. So any phase that this psi 1 has is going to come up with a minus sign here and cancel each other. Psi 2 comes with psi 2 conjugate. That also kills the phase of psi 2. And psi 3 psi. So this is, this is independent under local phase changes. It's a very beautiful idea. And yet, overall, it gives you a certain phase because this is some real number uh, times e to the i some phase. Okay. <coughs> It's a very deep idea, actually, and 
and, and it links back to the interferometers that we were talking about and everything and everything else. So that's the that's a meaningful way of, of talking about the phase. Even though the overall phase in front of your state cannot be detected, and none of these guys have a have a defined phase on its own on their own, you can always talk about the relative phase between two states given that you are talking about relatively to some other third states. And I can extend this to as many states as you like. Now, why is this an important uh, topic? Because of the following. Uh, imagine that we have an interferometer. Um, imagine that we have an interferometer that I mentioned before, where I have a two-level atom driven by some kind of uh, field. Uh, laser, let's say, drives this two-level atom. Uh, this typically people think of as some kind of coherent state, okay? And, and, and the important bit here is that this guy has a phase itself, okay? So you can think of a coherent state as some kind of sinusoidal wave. And phase of this guy just means this number here or whatever. How far is it away from some thing that you consider the origin of your, of your coordinate frame? Of course, there is no way you can know the phase of your laser because all of these atoms emit randomly and the phase in, in a way translates to time of emission. And I have no idea when they emit. There's too many of them. So phase, in, in a sense, is not a meaningful quantity in the same way that the overall phase of your state here really is not such a meaningful quantity. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to drive a two-level system with this, with this coherent state. Okay? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say um, this guy interacts with the atom in the ground state. And what I'm going to produce is the same coherent state alpha. But, but this phase, the theta phase, is going to be encoded in the superposition between these two. Okay? So basically, whatever the phase is, and I'm claiming I don't know the phase, is going to be kicked in into the two-level system. Okay? And now I'm destroying quantum mechanics. Now I'm going to prove to you that quantum mechanics cannot be right. Because I don't know the phase of the laser, which means I have to average over all possible phases 2 pi. If I average over all possible phases 2 pi in this state, this becomes a mixed state. So if I do an integral over d theta from 0 to 2 pi, possibly 1 over 2 pi to normalize it, and I do this e to the i theta e, times the conjugate of that, okay? Then the elements with phi will average to zero, and the only surviving guys will be GG plus EE. E. Whoops, I can never create a superposition. Never. There is no such thing as a superposition in this world. Okay? Surely this is absurd. Okay? Of course it's not like that, otherwise we wouldn't be doing quantum physics. Where's the catch? <coughs> the catch is that whoever does this experiment is intelligent enough to use the same laser at the end of the process to measure the atom. So there is no superposition without a reference frame. Okay, it's a very similar message to that. So when I say I have G plus E, I mean with respect to whatever has driven G plus E, not in this, with respect to anything you care to choose in the universe. Because with respect to anything else, this state is a maximum mess. You cannot do anything with this guy. Okay? So what do, what do experimentalists do? They prepare a superposition like that, and then they say, let's measure whether the system is excited in the ground. The same system that drives your guy here to prepare it will at the end of the experiment. So what people do is they take a laser light, they take a beam splitter, they take half of this guy to drive the system, to prepare it, and the other half to measure it. And now they have the same phase. I don't know the phase of, of, of either of them, but I know that whatever this phase here is, is the same on the other side. That's the beauty of it. I still don't know the phase, because the overall phase makes no sense. But I know relatively that each of the arms of the output has the same phase. So whatever drives the system is going to cancel this phase theta when I return it back. This is your arms interferon. This is a very important lesson. Um, and, and, and now it's an interesting uh, thing that, that lots of people debate. Um, 
So this is always lesson in quantum physics that you need you need to adjust the phases in order to be able to do anything and coordinate anything. And 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 an interesting point was made when when people did when people did uh, for example teleportation with with light because. Or you, you talk about teleportation with atoms. It's the same story. Or anything you care to choose, you need this kind of logic. So imagine that I'm trying to teleport, and, and I have a two-level system here, another two-level system on Bob's side, and here is the guy I want to teleport. So I make a measurement here. I communicate the result, and this guy adjusts his result. Okay. Now, in order to make a measurement here, I need to drive this with some laser with some phase theta, some, some coherent state of, of my laser. Okay? Now I'm going to phone Bob up and say the measurement is this guy. Can you please apply this transformation? But the guy has no clue what the transformation is. He hasn't got the phase. Okay? You need to coordinate the phase. It's the same as me saying I'm going to start at 10 o'clock. You better make sure it's 10 o'clock on your watch as well. All right? So now this guy has to send this beam. Oops, is he sending entanglement? What's entangled now? See, that's why this is a deep question. What's communicating now the message? Which bit? Is it because these guys are entangled, or is it because I'm sending a whole half of this beam of light for this guy to do the experiment with on the other side? Okay, now it looks far less mysterious. Okay? So there's a big debate about where does the information come from? Where does it, what's the channel that carries information and so on? Can you get rid of this space coordination at the expense of being a little bit less accurate and so on? So there was a big, big paper in PRL saying teleportation uh, is not really due to the entanglement between light beams, but it's due to the extra phase that comes from, from coordinating the phase of these driving laser fields. So you can imagine that these are two quantized fields. I think this was a uh, an experiment by J uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Kimball at Caltech, and he said, "Look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna teleport a light field by using entanglement between two light fields." But then, if you analyze what he's really doing, is he's distributing the whole thing through this kind of phase. It's a very important point. So everything has to be returned to this reference frame, and unless you and I have the same reference frame. You cannot really do any experiments. So that's exactly, you, imagine just trying to do Bell's inequalities with spins and me telling you, I'm measuring sigma z, please measure sigma z. And you say, sigma z, what's the z direction? And I say, hey, look at that star up there. That's called phase matching. I'm telling you the direction. You know, if you look up in the sky, there is a star with this intensity and so on. You say, oh, okay, that's what you mean by the z direction. Then my apparatus. But you have to do that before you start your experiment. If you don't do these things, that would be the equivalent in terms of spins, what, what I was doing here. So it's a really very, very important lesson. I think there's much more to be said about it. I'm probably going um, gonna to make a 10-minute a, a break now. And then when we come back, we, we, we continue with the with the Discord uh, discussion. Um, so now I, I again due to popular demand, uh, at least Marcelo cares about it. I guess that's what I mean by popular demand. Uh, I I will talk about this uh, subject because it really has exploded also in the last uh, couple of years, and I think lots of people think that there is something there. Um, I'll try to be brief because I really want to go on to, on to, on to another topic of error correction ultimately. I want to spend some time on that, but uh, let's see how far we go. You will remember that I talked about, I'm going to write it down as a, as a quantum network now. So at least something new comes out when I'm summarizing these things. You don't just hear the same old story. So a nice way of looking at an interferometer, this is what, uh, how uh, uh, a geek, sorry, not a geek, a computer scientist would, uh, uh, would uh, write down an, uh, uh, an interferometer. So basically, Hadamard is just a beam splitter. Um, and, um, and then you have, so basically, there's another Hadamard, if you remember, at the end, and then you measure. So, so um, the whole max-centered interferometer looks like a photon comes in, gets transformed 
into two outputs at the same time. And then you have something happening to one of them and not to the other. This one I'm writing as a con conditional gate. So I'll have a bunch of other qubits coming in here. Um, and uh, so they're prepared in some state, whatever the state is. And then this gate, again, could be very complicated quantum computation, if you like, acts on this guy. And, and what I'm measuring out, outside is really just the probability to get zero and the probability to get one. I only get two, I only have one qubit. I, I never measure the second register as it comes out. And what we concluded yesterday is that, so again, you know, the structure is a, a Fourier transform, something else, Fourier transform measure, the standard stuff. Uh, what, what we concluded yesterday is that basically, if you put a general state row, this probability here, um, so the probability here looks something like cos squared. Um, if you had an angle theta introduced here, forget the unitary now, it would look something like cos squared theta over 2. And this would be sine squared uh, theta over 2. So this P0, think of it as 1 plus cos theta divided by 2. And, and having, having a non-trivial variation, theta, means that you have some kind of interference fringes. That's how an experimental physicist would talk about a meaningful result. If, 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 if the probability is always one half, that means that this, there is no effect uh, of the operation you did in the middle, and, uh, and basically that's equivalent to no interference fringes. So now, uh, what you do is you say, how is my uh, interference pattern affected by a state row and by, by, by the unitary u? And, and what I claimed yesterday is that the main quantity looks a bit funny, looks a bit unphysical, but it's not, um, is, is trace of u times rho. Um, and this contains everything you, you need to know about the interference. So this is a complex number in general. <coughs> it has a, it has a, a real part. Um, why don't we call it visibility? Uh, I think this is also different to the notation yesterday, just to spice it up a little bit. And, uh, and let's call this phase uh, phi. So what happens in general, when you, you know, you can think of this row and the unitary as an environment to your interferometer. So now your interferometer, if it's in state 1, entangles itself to the environment, and if it's in state 0, it doesn't do anything. So now you have a way of discriminating the two parts, 0 and 1, which is why you get a change in interference fringes. It couldn't be simpler, right? It's a very simple formula. How does that affect P0? P0 now looks like 1 half plus v, that's the v, cos theta minus phi, OK? So the interference fringes get reduced, in some sense, by this factor v. And they get shifted by the phi factor here. And once you know the v and you know the phi, if you repeat this zillion times, you will get this factor here. OK, that was my logic yesterday. Uh, so that's all. That's all very nice and uh, and uh, and simple. Someone one, uh, once asked me, you know, why did you have theta minus phi? Why not theta plus phi? And my answer was, uh, if it makes you happy, you know, put plus. It makes. It really depends how you define your phase, e to the i phi or e to the minus i phi, whatever you think of, of a positive or a negative frequency contribution. So basically, this formula now tells you how to how to get that quantity. Then I said, what if rho? is identity, maximum mean state. So it looks like I'm screwing things up a lot because I'm, I'm introducing something that is completely depolarized. Every qubit, I kill all the off-diagonal elements and I make it maximum and mean. So how's that going to give me anything interesting? And, and the quantity that you're now measuring is just a trace of u. So this is something you can extract quantum mechanically after something like n steps, where n is the number of qubits that you have there. Okay? So I can measure some of the diagonal elements of a matrix with efficiency n quantum mechanically. <coughs> Classically, I have to sum up, remember this u acts on n qubits. It means it's 2 to the n times 2 to the n matrix. It's got 2 to the n eigenvalues. And if I sum them all up, I have to perform 2 to the power of n summations. It's exponentially bad. You cannot do it efficiently. 
quantum, I've got this guy. So quantum efficiency is this classical inefficiency, if you like to call it like that, is E2 to the end. This exponential gap. And then I said, look, this also happens to be the case no matter how much you mix even this guy. Now I say, what if this guy is state zero uh, with some probability which is just an epsilon above half? I just go a smidgen above half, very small amount. No matter any, you tell me the number. It doesn't matter. And then with one half minus, I put maximally mixed state. So now I've got n qubits maximally mixed. And even this qubit is almost maximally mixed within an epsilon. <coughs> doesn't matter, because as long as I have some fraction, some fraction above this, I should probably put this as, as one. If, you want. If, I have, if I have some fraction above, above the maximal in each state, I'm fine. All this means is that I have to repeat my algorithm something like one over epsilon times. So it doesn't matter. If epsilon is constant, then this is my efficiency now. It still scales as n, because this is a constant number, 10 to minus 50 or whatever. It okay, doesn't matter, it's, it's a constant. This guy is still exponentially inefficient. And the interesting conclusion to that is that if you really make this, make this very mixed, then there is no entanglement between, uh, between qubits anywhere. <coughs> so I, I have an example of an exponentially efficient quantum algorithm without any entanglement. And of course the question is then what's responsible? And I think, well, I stopped at that point yesterday, okay? I wanted to make it as, as usual, like, uh, like Chekhov's short story, as I like to call it, and I stopped at the, at, the, at the most exciting point of the story, and I didn't tell you the punchline, because then you go out and find out the punchline yourself, and it's more exciting. But like I said, now I'm gonna turn into a Hollywood production, and I'm gonna tell you the full story, and it's a happy ending, and you know, they live happily around. So here is the guy. Um, if you don't have any entanglement, you can ask yourself, is this state a separable state? And the answer is yes, but, but is it more than that? And the answer is no. So, so here is what I mean. If you look at the division between this qubit and those qubits here, then the state can be written like, like this. Um, pi rho 1i tends to the rest of this. Let's call them rho n, n other qubits, i. Now, this state still allows for some kind of superpositions to exist within these states. What I'm trying to say is that these guys are not going to be fully distinguishable among themselves, and neither are these guys. So this is not the same as a classical correlated uh, probability distributions in the sense of pi and then some orthogonal basis i, okay, and some other orthogonal basis uh, psi i. Okay? This state cannot, in general, be written like that. So I'm assuming that psi i, psi j are orthogonal. If you could write it like that, then this would be equivalent to a classical stochastic, just random computation. And I know that this guy is very bad at computing a guy like that. It's just it's got to execute all 2 to the n additions. There is no getting away from that. So I know that the state is not of this type. And then you ask yourself, but it's also not entangled. That means it's got to be of this type. And the quantity that was very helpful there, and I think I talked about it two weeks ago, was this Discord, where, where there were two different ways of computing mutual information for this quantity, and they were not the same. And this guy is non-zero, and it seems to be scaling in exactly the way as the efficiency scales here, somehow exponential. The gap is exponential. So in a way, what you would do is if you remember what I said is that there is, there is one way of computing, uh, computing entropy, which is to say compute entropy of A, compute entropy of B, this is mutual information, and subtract entropy of AB. The other way is compute entropy of A and subtract A if I'm given B. And if you do this with quantum mechanical systems, these guys are not going to be equal to each other. And the difference, the difference between these two is what's known as discord. And this guy is non-zero for states like this. And so this was, uh, this, was, uh, this was a big result a couple of years ago in the group of uh, a guy called Carlton Cage and, uh, in, in New Mexico. And basically they came up with this and they said, look, maybe this is not the quantity that matters here. Okay? I said this was going to be a happy ending, but I have to be a little bit negative because I'm a scientist after all, so it's not all happy ending. This is a nice thing. 
to calculate, and it's a nice observation. But any quantity you compute for a very mixed state, it's going to scale like the discord. So if you want to say it's really discord that does the job, then you will be finding that each of these quantities scales effectively in the same way. So I might as well say, look at the entropy of the whole guy. Just the entropy of the whole state. That has no meaning as far as correlations are concerned. But even that guy is going to scale like, like the discord. Or 1 minus that is going to scale like the discord. So in a way, uh, in a way this guy is going to be the same as 1 minus the entropy of rho a, b. Uh, namely, it's going to scale as 2 to the n. Um, and I think that's the bad news because you say, if you say that's because of discord, I say, what about the entropy? What about the, some other quantities like the mutual information? What about the conditional entropy? They all scale the same way. And that's the bad thing. And it, it, it's a story that happens over and over again. Whenever you make something very mixed and you're testing whether you can now do Grover or Shore or whatever, you're going to encounter something like that. And that's the trouble there. But it's a nice story. It's a nice uh, point to, to research on. Let me now conclude this call logic with, with an interesting topic. Um, this, this is going to capture, so you can always, uh, I think, we've been discussing a lot different physical implementations of quantum computation. How much information can I store into, into something? And I even started the course by saying that this is a question for a physicist to answer, not for a mathematician. So how much information a certain region in space can contain and how quickly I can move it from that region to another really just depends on the laws of physics. It's not, a, it's not an area for a mathematician to worry about, it's an area for a physicist to worry about. Okay? This guy captured this in a very universal way. Uh, he's another student of John Wheeler, essentially, and he worked on black holes, and this is where he came uh, from. Uh, but actually, he derived something that's a universal bound in, in, in quantum mechanics. So I'll, I'll just show you a Mickey Mouse derivation of this argument, because effectively, to really test it for all of these things, you have to write down a general quantum field. And then you have to show that if you isolate the region of space of this field, you will get this kind of scan. That's also very beautiful calculations. So I'll say a little bit about it, <coughs> but I want to just argue with it. So what I want to know now is how much info... So I claimed last time that 1,000 qubits, if you give me 1,000 qubits, I can, I can factorize a 1,000 digit number in one second on a quantum computer, okay? And this is to be contrasted with 10 to the power of 50 seconds, which is how long it takes a classical computer to do that, okay? So there's a huge exponential gap. And now you ask me, what do I need to give you to encode 1,000 1, quantum bits? And the interesting thing is that you might think that you have to give me 1,000 atoms. But of course, 1,000 atoms is overdoing it. Because you are being very inefficient since you use only two levels of each atom as a qubit. But we know that atoms have many degrees of freedom, many energy levels. There are spins inside, there is the nucleus, there are nuclear components inside and so on. And now, what if I add them all up? How many? qubits do I get there? Can I actually do it just with a single atom? Can I do it with a single atom in one second and I beat all the classical computers in this world? How cool is that? And I say yes. I'm not sure you why. Uh, well, it's easy for me. I'm a theoretical physicist. Of course, someone still has to do it. But I'm just telling you do it. You know, there is no problem with that. So um, what did he say? He said, imagine I have a certain region in phase space. I mean, it's easiest to think of a sphere. I mean, it's a standard joke about physicists. You know, let's measure the heat capacity of a horse. Let's assume it's a sphere initially, and then we get some numbers. Okay, it is as funny as that. And so now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that there is a certain amount of energy inside this sphere. And I'm going to ask, what is the highest number of bits that I can pack inside? You'll see that I'm going to be a little bit, it's a little bit rough in some sense, just to get the the message across. Entropy is the log of the number of possible states that I can have inside. Um, as we said, classically you can divide space in infinitely and this entropy is always infinite, which already tells you that there is something deeply uh, worrying about classical physics. This should be enough to kind of say we need something new in many ways. Quantum mechanically you haven't got that problem. 
And if you think about this n, so you know, this is always less than or equal, if you like, to n. So it's going to be a rough way of dividing it, but you can see that some systems come very close to the bound itself. In fact, black holes are thought to saturate this bound. They're the densest, the most entropic things you can imagine in this universe. Now, um, n. N is the number of states. Imagine I have some kind of uh, phase space diagram. So I have uh, momentum and I have position. And I'm looking at some, some region where my system is. And now I'm trying to divide it to see how many states do I have here. So I have to see how many partitions I can make in P and in, uh, and in X. So if you think of this as the radius of your system here, uh, then, then this guy is going to be the momentum value, whatever is the spanning momentum. Uh, and it's going to be times r, but it's going to be divided by the smallest square that I can have, which of course is delta p delta x, which of course is h bar. So quantum mechanically, um, this smallest unit here uh, cannot be, so I'm going to make it actually optimistic, cannot be, cannot be smaller than, than h bar. And so what, what Bekenstein says is you can think of this nicely as momentum times the radius divided by h bar. Um, and, and actually you can, you, can, you, can, you can relate it to energy if you think that all you have inside, um, again it's a very rough argument so you can, you can do it more formally with relativity, but if you think that this P, if you think of, of, uh, of energy in a relativistic sense of that word, like for, for massless particles, it's something like momentum times the speed of light, then basically I can substitute energy divided by C there, and the bound then reads, and that's the bound that he really derived, energy times the radius divided by um, C and H bar. Okay? So I've got, I've got two fundamental physical constants. I've got the energy of your system, the radius of your system, and I've got the total entropy. So this says the entropy is never greater than ER divided by H bar C. That's a universally valid bound for any system in this universe. Okay. Um, and now people go into doing all sorts of fun things. Uh, I'm going to, of course, uh, now take an atom or a nucleus, and I'm going to show you how many, how many bits you can have that. There. But basically what people do is people, uh, you know, people who do artificial intelligence, they take a human head now, and they say, let's calculate the capacity, the number of bits I can have inside a human head. It's a very cute calculation. Okay? You'll be very pleased with the answer. We are all super smart, actually. So the number of... Uh, well, actually, smartness is to do with how quickly you can flip them, and that's the next bound due to Bekenstein, but never mind. Give us the capacity of your, of your qubits. So, um, think now of energy. You see, I'm flipping between these two different definitions. Think of energy now as, as, uh, as the rest mass, because, of course, your head is a, is a very slow-moving object, uh, and, uh, and you can really use the other formula for that. So, basically, mc squared r, so c and c cancel out, and I've got this guy, okay? And now I don't, you know, what is the radius of your head? I have no idea. I mean, 0.1 uh, meter or something like that. What's the mass? The mass is something like uh, 20 kilos or whatever it is. <laughs> In the best case scenario. Uh, and, and so, who cares? Okay, let's say that these two numbers multiply to 1, just to make it uh, very easy to calculate. Let's say that the speed of light is 10 to the power of 8. There is a factor of 3, but doesn't matter between friends. And now this is the h bar, and you can see that this is something like 10 to the 42. Note the Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy 42. Um, your head contains uh, 10 to the power of 42 bits of information. The entropy is huge. This is huge. Current computers, by the way, have uh, 10 to 12 giga something like that, a bit more than that. It's growing exponentially, okay, they're trying to catch up, but it's still a long way to go. <coughs> of course, we are not all using all of these bits, and it's anyway an upper bound, and so on and so forth. But it's an interesting one. You can also calculate for the universe, and it's surprisingly low. I mean, this makes me feel very claustrophobic now. It's a small place to be, you know? <laughs> so, put in, put, in, put in something like uh, 15 billion light years inside, okay? That's current estimate, 13.8. You know, astronomers change their mind on a daily basis. I have no idea how big it is. It's probably 15 billion. I think I've just about insulted every possible 
easy system mathematician on camera. <laughs> but basically, if you put that in there for the whole universe, <coughs> some people do these kind of things. It's roughly 10 to 1, 100. Not much more. Hey, this is not a big number. This is a big number. No, 100 digits is, is very small. I've only got that many bits to explain, and I've understood everything there is in the universe. It's a cute result. Um, and of course, some people who claim that the universe is a quantum computer, then they compute how quickly can you process how many gates per second you can do. And you can see, actually, if you divide this by the speed of light, convert it into time, you will see that roughly you can do 10 to 100 uh, bits, uh, bit flips in the, during the, the total time of the evolution of the universe. And that tells you about the bit rate, the clock speed of our universe. So you can really do these things. Okay, this is all, of course, uh, uh, not so serious. But if you now do, let's do an atom. And that's going to be a bit more serious, because now I want to know how much capacity am I... I'm calling an atom a two-level system. You know, I keep calling it the G and the E, and I'm moving between G and E and back, and that's, of course, very boring, so can I do better than that? And, of course, uh, the answer is that you can, because this M now, again, it's just uh, M times... So M is something like 10 to minus 27 kilograms. C, again, is 10 to the power of 8, if you like. The radius of an atom is uh, an angstrom, I suppose, 10 to minus uh, 10 uh, meters, and then I'm dividing again by, by 10 to minus 34, okay? So this is 10 to minus 37, it's 10 to power of 5, unless I made some serious mistake. 10,000 bits in an atom. I said 1,000 is enough for me to destroy the network of all classical computers factorizing 1,000 digit number. You know, it's inside an atom on an area that's squeezed into an angstrom. How cool is this? Okay, one atom is more powerful than anything we now have in classical physics. Okay. Nucleus, too small, too small. Nucleus of an atom is as heavy as the atom, <coughs> but it's exactly 10,000 times smaller. Size of the nucleus is a phantom. 10 to minus 15, so I can squeeze one bit into a nucleus, roughly. If you put your numbers correctly, you will get something like 8, not 1, because you've got some spins there, and there, there are some constituents, but roughly, for nuclear, it's on the order of 1. So actually, NMR is as good as it gets. An atom already has a huge amount of space that you're not using there, and this is a very good uh, news to us. Okay, now...